Hello, I'm Ted Elmore, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Harlingen, Texas, and we thank you for joining us in our worship service today. On screen is information how you may connect with us, and if we can help you find your place in God's story, we would be delighted to do so. Again, we pray this video is a blessing to you and a help to you. May God richly bless you. Well, thank you, team, and good morning, church. It's good to see each of you, and thank you, Tyler, for praying for our uh, super summer. They leave Friday. Uh, a bunch of them leave Friday. I think we've got 26 kids going this year, and uh, they're going to go a little early and sort of at another campsite have what's typical disciple now. And uh, Stacy and the team leaders, uh, Brad and Jennifer, all of them are going to meet together, and we're going to have our own little camp prior to them going to Super Summer. So, uh, again, just keep in mind the reason we do this is to pour Jesus as much as we can into everybody we can. And so if you'd open your Bible to the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 4, we read it on the board, and uh, it was on screen, and we read the text for the morning message. But how many of you have heard the term religious? Now, not I-O-U-S, but I-S, religious-ish. That was sort of a new one for me. Well, what on earth is that? Uh, in a generation that's marked by NUI and existential dread, the Gen Z generation, more and more young people are turning to therapeutic practices that look like traditional religion for comfort and security. Now, when I say traditional religion, don't make the mistake of thinking like it was when I was growing up. The word is religion, not Christianity. It could be any religion in the world. And so why is it appealing? Girls Magazine I had an article by, no, I don't read Girls Magazine, but I, I, get, uh, I get a site called the Cultural Translator that keeps up with the culture and what's happening. But Freya India commented that several of the activities that hold the Gen Zers interest appear to be a God-free religion. Now, follow me. We don't pray at night. We repeat positive affirmations. We don't confess. We trauma dump. We don't seek salvation. We are on healing journeys. India notes that without the backbone of faith, these practices are just meant to make the penitent feel better. But declining mental health statistics tell us it isn't working. Without the parts of religion that exist outside of us, the church, Scripture, and above all, an omnipotent God, spirituality is an exercise in futility. Paul is addressing some of that. He's warning Timothy about the last days. And when he talks about the last days here, he says, Now the Spirit expressly says uh, that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And what he's talking about there, that word expressly just simply means that it happens with haste. And the last days in Scripture or basically depends on what theologian you want to read. Uh, some say they're Pentecost to the consummation of the age. Uh, I rather think it's with the advent of Jesus to the consummation of the age, and that's considered the last age. This is a dispensation. It's an economy of God, and it's a time period. So that doesn't mean that everything is going to happen all at once, but it means these things will happen in increasing numbers. Now, I believe the Bible teaches there are two things that you can watch for. I know some people look for a lot of Old Testament stuff and, and things of that nature, but as we approach the end, there are two things that the New Testament gives us insight to. One is a revival of the Christian faith among the Jewish people. The book of Acts talks about this often. Daryl Bach, one of the great professors at Dallas Theological Seminary uh, talked about the until passages in Luke 
uh, chapter 13, 35, chapter 21, verse 24, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, and Acts chapter 3, 19 through 21. And I love that one in Acts chapter 3, uh, verses 19 through 21. So I want to read it to you and give you an insight into what we're talking about when we talk about a revival among the Jewish people. Uh, the writer says these words. Now, they're, they're just out of jail. Peter's out of jail. It's his second sermon. And he says, repent, therefore, and be converted. In other words, turn. Have your heart changed that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. And there are many, many wonderful scholars that are looking for that end-time work of the Spirit of God in which Jewish people begin to come to faith in Jesus Christ all over the globe. We often focus our concentration on that little landmass called Israel in the Middle East. But remember, that is also a people group. And there was only one theocracy in all of the Bible, and that was Israel. No other government is a theocracy. Here it seems that Luke, through Simon Peter, is prophesying that times of refreshing, not only for Gentiles, but also for the Jewish people, will come in the latter days. There's another sign, and that's the one we want to give our attention to this morning, and that is apostasy in the church. That's what Paul is writing about here when he warns Timothy, and he says that some will depart from the faith, and that word is uh, aposte santi, aposte santi. That means a, a falling away and a moving aside from where things have been historically. It's a departure from the truth of the doctrines of the faith. And those things seem to be going to happen more and more and more in the end times. Dr. Mark Yarber said, while the whole Bible is Christocentric, Many evangelical writings and teachings today move from the fall straight to the Gospels. But the macro structure of the Bible is outlined as creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. And we are a fallen people. And even though we've been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I still deal with the old fallen sinful nature. And he warns us that in the latter days some will give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And I think we're there. When you look at this chapter and you look at other chapters, for example, the first five verses in 1 Timothy 4 and then in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9, I'm going to read that and we'll look at it later on in the sermon. But Paul writes and says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be, and I'll listen to this, Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. And he goes on to describe those. And he describes what that means in Titus chapter 1. He writes to Titus. Remember, these are the pastoral letters written to pastors. In chapter 1, he says, There are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Those were the Jewish Christians, the people uh, in that day that were Jewish and the people that were what they called Judaizers that insisted that in order to become a Christian, yes, you believe in Jesus, but you have to be circumcised according to the circumcision of Moses, whose mouths must be stopped, who pervert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. And then he goes on to describe more of those. And what you see in all of these is all of this is in the church. We rail at the government. 
We rail at the headlines. We rail at what unbelievers do and talk, oh, things are just getting so bad. Oh, this month it's this, it's that, it's the other and everything. And yeah, while there's truth in that and while we're saddened by that, what stops the work of God is when this stuff is in the body. That's what stops the work of God. And that's why the New Testament says, for it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Folks, you and I have to get it right before we can ever take the message to those outside. This is about us. Now, how do we get that way? He says, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. That's just like a branding iron. You know, when you brand a calf and you put that iron over the flesh of that calf, over the hide, it sears that so that that's a callus. Hair doesn't grow there. Nothing living is there on that brand anymore. It takes the life out of us. In verse 1, he says they give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. I want you to see what he's talking about here. There, there is, and this is what we must avoid. This is what we must stand against. This is what we must not be like, and that is to have unholy doctrine. Unholy doctrine. Now, we're not talking about tertiary issues. Paul, throughout his epistles, and later we'll see in Colossians, uh, in, in that book, it's about the preeminence of Christ and the lordship of Christ and who Jesus is. You and I may sit down and have discussions on methodology. We may have discussions on certain things that we're not sure that we totally understand what Scripture teaches. Some of those things that we think this is the way it's going to be, but we're not given enough information to know 100%. God help the person that thinks they're an expert on Scripture. We all should be learners. What is he talking about when he says doctrines of demons? I've struggled with this for a long time. I've traveled the globe. And I've seen what God's done in other countries and in other places. I've seen what you can preach and what you can't preach. And what you can't preach is illustrations. I remember being in Korea in 2004 for Baptist World Alliance meeting. The executive director of the, one of the state conventions was preaching, and he told more cornball illustrations about his church, and those poor Korean people sat there like, huh? Dr. Billy Kim, president of Baptist World Alliance, and that's a name that most of you don't know, but he's 80 89 years old, one of the godliest men in the world, and Dr. Kim got up and preached for 15 minutes, and I was sitting next to a former missionary, and I leaned over to him, and I said, he's correcting what the other fellow missed, and the missionary said, exactly, and he preached for 15 minutes, gave the invitation, and hundreds came to faith in Christ. We're not talking about those little tertiary issues, those little cultural issues. We're talking about the issue of Jesus Christ, and that's what Paul is talking about here and what he talks about in Colossians. And so the doctrines of demons, what happens? The best way that I can explain this to us is to call our attention to the church at Thyatira in Revelation. Jesus said through John in verse 19, I know your works, your love, your patience, your faith, and your uh, service, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. You think, man, this is a great church. They're working, they're hard at it, they're, they're on fire for the Lord. And then he says this, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and beguile my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according 
to your works. An ominous warning. What John is doing there uh, through the Holy Spirit, he's personifying this demonic spirit in the church, this demonic spirit that seeks to influence God's people, and we have that today just like they did then. That doesn't mean that everyone, I'm saying you're demon-possessed or anything like that, but I'm telling you, we have a devil who is our enemy, and he's seeking to move us as far away from Christ as he possibly can. And it was personified in that church by an individual whom John referred to as Jezebel. Why did he use that term Jezebel? Because in the Old Testament, Jezebel was the wife of a pagan king whom Ahab, a potential king of Israel, married, violating the word of God. Ahab was one of the most cowardly, wicked, uh, one person referred to him as a toad type king of Israel. And Jezebel had her schools of the prophets and prophets of the grove and everything like that, 850 false prophets that Elijah destroyed. And she promised to destroy Elijah in 1 Kings, and Elijah believed her and fled for his life. And Ahab wanted Naboth. Naboth was a citizen, had a wonderful vineyard, and Ahab wanted it, and he went crying to Jezebel, and Jezebel said, what's wrong with you? And he said, I want that vineyard, and I, I, I don't have it, and she basically said, I'll take care of it. So she called for a, a meal and bring Naboth in the midst of that, and she lied, and she had liars to lie on Naboth, and they destroyed him, and Ahab had his vineyard. But God always has the last word. And so through the prophet of God, God came and and said to Ahab that the dogs will lick your blood. And in battle, the enemy of Israel, some soldier just at random, fired his arrow. And he found a weak spot in Ahab's armor and killed him. And his blood ran out in the chariot in which he was riding. And as the prophet had said, the dogs came and licked the blood. Jehu, trying to restore righteousness to the nation of Israel, uh, went to where that vineyard was and looked up and said, who's with me? And two eunuchs raised their hand and said, we are. And they took Jezebel, the queen, and threw her down, and her body was broken and lifeless. And Jehu went in to eat lunch, and when he got through eating lunch and went back out to bury her body because she is a queen, he found that the dogs had eaten her flesh. The judgment of God was true. Now, it is this wicked woman that in the Revelation, John attaches a name to, but he's talking about the demonic influence of spirits that seek to control, seek to cause people to commit immorality, and seek to have the preeminence. The doctrine of demons. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul talks about the demonic influence and how we war. And it's not human beings, but it's the demonic influence influencing them behind them. And how can you know that? We just read about it in 2 Timothy just a moment ago when when we read all of those characteristics, all of those fleshly characteristics that are in the last days, lovers of self, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Have you ever seen anybody like that in church? Sort of a rhetorical question, isn't it? Paul said that's going to characterize the church in the last days. The closer we get to the coming of Christ, and Jesus even asked the question of his disciples one day, when I come, will I even find faith? He 
And here you have on one hand the potential of revival and on the other hand the declining of the people of God in the church. There is an unbiblical doctrine, and unbiblical doctrine leads to unholy asceticism, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. When Satan gets a foothold, it never stops. It always moves forward. It always takes God's people farther and farther and farther away from the Lordship of Christ. And that's what's happened here. And they always create rules. We got to have another rule. We got to have another regulation. We've got to have another thing to control people. You see the doctrine of the demons, the spirit of control of the spirit of Jezebel. And here, now we tell people who they can marry and who they can't marry. Now we tell them what they can eat and what they can't eat. All of that comes from the doctrine of demons. Now, doctrine is just simply what the Bible teaches. But the doctrine of demons is the doctrine what the devil wants to teach. And there's an unholy asceticism. And in the first century, it led to second century Gnosticism, the old heresy that basically said that the material things are nothing, they're immoral, and only the spiritual, only the mind, only what you can understand and comprehend with your mind. And they set up a whole different system. And Paul, combating that, writes in second in Colossians chapter 2 that uh, we're in verse 8. He said, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. In Him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism in which you were raised through Him, faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespass and uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made a alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Wow. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, therefore. Let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substances of Christ. And somebody ought to say amen. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And it's our focus and our commitment to Him and an unholy asceticism, an unholy unbiblical doctrine, unholy asceticism will lead us to an unhealthy practice. And this is where we get in trouble because we bring all that garbage that the the devil influences with and culture influences with in to the church, and it becomes more about tradition and more about what I want and more about turf and more about hardness of heart and unforgiveness, even sitting in the same house, pew, sometimes side by side in the same pew. And it's in every church. But I'm calling us to make the commitment today that it shall not be so here. James talked about that in chapter 3. He talks about wisdom. He said, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. 
For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing will be there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. One of my favorite authors was Dennis Kinlaw. And the reason I dropped so many of these names that you're not familiar with, I don't like to plagiarize. I, I want you to understand. And Dennis Kinlaw made a quote. I'm going to ask him to put it on the screen. But I'm going to read it to you. He's in heaven now, but he, he was a great, great professor and pastor. He said, Satan disguises submission to himself under the ruse of personal autonomy. He never asked us to become his servants. Never once did the serpent say to Eve, I want to be your master. The shift in commitment is never from Christ to evil. It is always from Christ to self. And instead of his will, self-interest now rules, and what I want reigns, and that is the essence of sin. Isn't that good? Doesn't that just sort of bring it right down to where we live and, and let us all have to grapple with this? Now, when Paul writes to Timothy, remember verse 15 in chapter 3, uh, I write so that you may know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Paul's writing to this young pastor, and he's writing to me. He's not just writing to the church, but he's writing to me. He's writing to leaders. We'll look at this as we trek through the pastorals another week, but not this week. But this word pastor that we use for people who occupy my position, there are three of those words in the pastorals. One of them is the word elder, presbyteros is the Greek word of elder, and it places emphasis on the authority that leadership has to rule or lead in the church. Another word is bishop, which means overseer. It emphasizes the fact that the leadership is charged with overseeing the local church and as such is responsible for the spiritual well-being of those in the church. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 refers to we who lead, we who are on staff here, as we watch for your souls. It's a high responsibility that one day I will stand before God and give an account for how I stewarded this. It's not trivial stuff. It's not about control. It's not about authoritativeness. And the last word that we call it pastor just means shepherding. It means caring. Paul is writing to those of us who occupy that position and warning about the church. And again, we'll look at it later, but only God has authority. All else is delegated. Jesus himself said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. It was delegated by the Father. Authority for the servant of God is representative. It's not inherent. That means it's not authoritativeness. Spiritual authority is not authoritativeness and it's not control. It is the opposite of the Jezebel spirit. It is God working His purpose through called and gifted leadership under the Lordship of Christ. Watchman Nee in his book, Spiritual Authority, he said, We ourselves have not the slightest authority in the home, the world, or the church. All we can do is execute God's authority. We represent God's authority. Are you getting the picture? It comes from God. God calls. God places leaders. God gives authority to secular government. We see that in other portions. And Alistair Begg, one of my favorites, in his pastor's conference, 
said this to pastors, listen to the voice of God. Seek the face of God and pray for the people of God. I don't know if it was God's timing or what precipitated it, but I've been sensing more and more and more like we're, we're right at a point where God is about to break through in great blessing for our church. We're not there yet, but it's going to happen. What I say to you is not a gauntlet, but it is a pastor who loves you, who wants to see God move more than anything else. And I'm calling us today, and I'm going to ask you to give a visible sign of this in a moment. I'm calling us today to say to our God, Father, I present myself. These things that Paul talked about, I find myself afflicted with those attitudes, with wanting what I want, with unforgiveness, unloving. All of these things, I find myself in that. And so I'm presenting myself to you, asking for your cleansing. And asking that I reject the flesh that the devil keeps bringing and reminding me of and that we reject anything that the enemy would bring to us. As one body, we ask that we live for you, that Jesus be Lord in every area. I'm not anybody's Holy Spirit. I'm not calling anybody out. I'm not targeting anybody But as your pastor, fulfilling what God has spoken in the pastoral letters, I'm asking you to make that commitment in just a moment. I want to tell you a story first. Hopefully to make a little sense. This past week, a 98-year theologian by the name of Jurgen Moltmann died. He was not an evangelical. He was one of Hitler's youth during World War II. He was raised in an unbelieving family. Moltmann is a young German soldier in Hamburg, was in a machine gun nest, and when the British Air Force came over and bombed it, he was thrown completely clear of that into a lake that they were beside, and he held on to a piece of wood until he was rescued. He was sent to Scotland to a prisoner of war camp, and a chaplain gave him a New Testament and Psalms, and he began to read Psalm 39 over and over and over, and he read the book of Mark, and he gave his life to Jesus, and Moltmann, and I don't agree with all of his theology, I'm not recommending his books, but from where he was to where he came, it was light years, and Moltmann made this statement about his con- version. He said, I didn't find Christ. Christ found me. And this day, Christ, the hound of heaven, is finding us and calling us to a new level of spiritual commitment and the courage to deal with these issues that are in our lives. And He loves you so much. Some of you He's calling to salvation. Some of you He's calling perhaps to join this church. I don't know what He's calling you to do. But I'm going to pray for us and then we'll have our regular invitation. And I know there are those coming today to join the church and others can come with them. But I want to ask you, Calvary Baptist Church members, this is your pastor pleading with you in the name of Jesus. If you will say the things that I said just a moment ago, God, I am yours. Take all of me, use all of me, and help me to confess everything and make everything right in my life that your spirit impresses me with. I want you to stand on your feet. 
to stand up. If you would say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. If you're a member of this church, if that's your heart, you stand up. And if you don't want Jesus to be your Lord, you stay seated. Now, if there are guests with us, and that's your heart as well, you're welcome to stand with us. Now, let me stand. Because it begins here in each of our hearts. And let me pray with you. Father, our whole body is standing. We're yours. God, I pray that right now you would carve out this day as a day when we have said to you, we are done with the turfism of the past. We're done with unforgiveness. We're done with griping. We're done with all of these things. We want Jesus to be Lord in our lives and in our church. Father, accept this and deal with each of us as your Spirit would please. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Seal it with your Holy Spirit. And we bless you and we praise you. Now, while we're standing, let's all stand together. If God has spoken to your heart about trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, He's finding you today. He's searching for you. Meet me here at the front. Just step out from where you are while they sing and meet me here at the front. And if you're coming to join this church, you come as well, and I'll meet you right here at the front. As we sing, you, while standing, sing and make your commitment to Christ.